This is a QA1 coil over spring. It's designed to mount to the shock right there. And this larger end is designed to fit up in the spring pocket. This came on a kit that QA1 says is for a Chevy. I want to put it on my 62 Galaxy. Let's see if we can make that happen. Spoiler alert, I did this modification in 2014. So yes, yes we can put this on a 62 Galaxy. <laughs> Greetings fellow DIYer and welcome to another episode of I Didn't Shoot Any Video For That. As I said in my open, this project happened about a decade ago. I've only been making YouTube videos for about two years, so obviously I don't have any video footage of this install. But at the time I took lots of pictures, so I will be showing you the pictures of the process, talking about my thought process as I was making this fit, and by the end of this video, you should have a pretty good idea how you could make this work in your own car. This is the basic stock suspension of my 62 Galaxy. The sway bar is significantly bigger than the factory one, but other than that, everything is stock. We have a coil spring that fits up into the pocket in the frame, and then there's also a pocket in the lower control arm. And then you have a shock that goes inside the spring connecting the frame to the lower control arm. First, we need to discuss why a coilover system is better. The biggest advantage is adjustability. You have the ability to adjust height and you have the ability to adjust shock pressures. This allows you to dial your ride in. The other advantage of having a coilover type setup is you now have a spring system that is pivoting freely on the lower control arm. In the case of a spring sitting in a pocket on the lower control arm, there is some flex from side to side and it's not as smooth an action. These three factors, the ability to adjust shock pressure, the ability to adjust height, and better suspension action are why a coilover is a massive upgrade over the stock system. So if we're going to go with a coilover, what parts do we use? At the time, there was no coilover options available that were listed as something that works on a 62 Galaxy. There is now a company that is producing a coilover kit for early galaxies, and I believe they're charging just under $1,000 for the kit. The coilover system that I purchased almost 10 years ago, I was able to get for $400, and it is currently listed for $665. That's significantly less than the $1,000 kits that are on the market. So the question is, what kit do we use? Well, I spent a lot of time looking at specs on coilover kits that were ready available. And the important things were total travel, spring dimensions, and the spring rate. Now, if you look at these part numbers, the important thing is the C at the end of each of these part numbers. That is the spring that has the correct OD at the top to fit into the Galaxy spring pocket. The A and B part numbers of the same part number have smaller diameter upper end on the springs and or a different configuration in the way the spring is shaped. The other important number are the last three numbers of each part number. We have the 350C, the 400C, and the 450C. That is the spring rate. When I did this upgrade originally, a big part of why I did it is I had significantly lightened the front end of my car. I had removed the 352 that was in the vehicle. I had installed a 302 with an aluminum intake and aluminum heads. I had installed a T5 transmission with aluminum bell housing. And so we had lost a lot of weight up front. And because of that, the upper lip of my fender well was sitting about four inches above the tires. When I purchased the kit, I went with the 350 pound springs. I was thinking that that would be a good rate. I'm a big fan of going with softer springs and stiffer shocks. That allows you to get more motion out of your suspension and, and allowing it to react to imperfections in the road. Turns out those springs were just a little bit light, and I eventually had to replace them with 400 pound springs. 
So in my case, I would have been better off buying the GS401-10400C springs. So here's a comparison of the shock that came out of my suspension and the QA1 shock. There is an inch less travel on the QA1 shock, but that's not a problem at all because the shock immediately to its left had to be compressed more than an inch just to install it. So we are sitting at roughly the same stroke on the shocks. Here we have a bump stop that is on the QA1 shock and they recommend that you leave it there. But in this particular case, I chose to remove it just so that I would have a little extra stroke if need be. There is a good quality bump stop on the lower control arm that comes in contact with the frame and it would prevent any damage to the shock long before we have maxed out stroke. Here you can see the shock with no spring fitting up into the pocket and everything fits beautifully up into the top. Here we have a comparison of the OEM spring next to the coilover system with the coilover spring fully extended. Now this isn't a very accurate comparison because these springs are totally different and they're going to compress totally different. But it was a good indicator that this system could probably be made to work. Here we have the OEM spring compared to the QA1 spring and what I'm showing is that the top where it goes up into the pocket is the same. The diameter is virtually the same. The Galaxy spring is ever so slightly bigger but having the QA1 spring be a little smaller did not affect how it fit in the pocket at all. As you can see it fits beautifully. Everything slides up in there. It sits where it needs to sit. It's not moving around. It's almost like it was designed to go there. Now this was the beginning of my fabrication work. I mocked up the shock on the lower control arm and then I added the spring. I wanted to make sure that there were no obvious issues where things weren't going to fit right or where there was going to be a problem. The biggest concern I have looking at this is we are now putting the entire weight of the vehicle on two little bolt holes on the lower control arm. This is not what Ford intended. Ford created that pocket for the spring in the lower control arm so that the weight of the vehicle could be dispersed over a large area. And if I were to run this the way I have it mocked up here, I have no doubt that over time we're going to have fatigue at that opening and the lower control arm is probably going to break. Technically, you could bolt this GM kit directly into your Galaxy with no modification, but I do not recommend that at all. So the easiest solution to fitting this kit into my car would have been to weld two plates across the shock mounting holes, still utilize the original mounting holes, and that would allow you to disperse the weight over more of the lower control arm. I didn't want to do that. My philosophy when I am retrofitting something is to always make it a bolt-in. Failure is always an option. And I didn't want to get all this together and do a bunch of welding and totally modify my lower control arms and then find out that this system wasn't going to work. So for me, a better solution was to create a spacer, something that fit in the lower control arm just like the coil spring and allowed the lower control arm to take the weight of the vehicle as designed. To do that, the easy solution was to cut the top off of a coil spring. This created a nearly perfect spacer that I could then weld plates to and make the bottom mounting surface. Because the spring didn't fit perfectly in the pocket, I did have to cut it so that the plates were perfectly aligned and so there wasn't any angles to them. I'm not worried about the fact that these springs were cut. This steel being spring steel is not really even important at that point. I realize when you weld spring steel, it can take the springiness out of it. But all I am doing is using the bottom of the spring as a spacer. I added a second bolt hole. The original mounting hole for the shock is now the mounting hole for the QA1 setup, but I did have to enlarge the holes to 3 8 This is not a big deal if I ever decided to go back to an OEM style shock, although I can't think of any reason that I would ever want to do that. 
I wanted everything to be locked into place, and I didn't want to rely on just the shock mounting bolts to hold everything where it needed to be. So I drilled a second set of holes mirroring the first set so that this adapter plate is firmly secured. Here it is all finished up. I have it welded together. I welded the spring back together. I had to do a little grinding to ensure the perfect fit. And then of course welded the plates on the top. As you can see, this kit looks right at home. In fact, I think it looks better than the OEM system. I have easy access to adjust the shock. The spring fits nicely up in the pocket. And of course, it provides all the benefits we were talking about when I was explaining why I did this project to begin with. So here's an interesting picture. We have on the left the original ride height of my car, and as you can see, that is terrible. There is well over four inches of space between the top of that tire and the fender lip. Like I said, this was a direct result of shaving several hundred pounds off the front end of this car. When I installed the coilover setup on the driver's side, the picture on the right was the result. And to me, that's about perfect. That tire still clears the fender so that we don't have turning radius problems. It's fairly tucked up in there so it's not obtrusive. It just looked great. Problem is, I have a really aggressive sway bar on this car and there was a stock spring still on the passenger side. Picture on the left, this is the picture you've already seen where there's only a coil over on the driver's side. Once I installed the other coil over on the passenger side, the result was the picture on the right. And at that point, we had almost no suspension travel left and the wheel was sitting way too high up in the fender. Not a problem because this kit is adjustable. When I installed the coilover shocks, I set the springs at the lowest setting because I had no clue how the springs and shocks were going to react. I got out my spanner wrench and was able to adjust the coil spring up about an inch and a half and that gave me about the perfect ride height. It was still a little low and it was definitely a little soft. Again, I made the mistake of going with the 350s, but I was able to drive the car that way for quite a bit of time. A couple of years ago, I did upgrade the springs and I did go to the 400 pound and that made all the difference. It gave me plenty of clearance from the lip of the fender to the wheels and the suspension was perfect. It wasn't so soft that things were bottoming out, but it also wasn't so harsh that it felt like I was driving a tank. When it comes to handling, this is hands down the single biggest upgrade I have made to this car. The one inch sway bar is probably a close second and the rack and pinion steering obviously brought it into the modern era. But this coilover suspension makes the car fun to drive and makes the car comfortable to drive. This is how the car looks today. As you can see, there's a really nice gap between the wheel and the fender. The car has a really nice rake and is sitting really well. However, that will change as I'm doing other things to this car. I intend to put a Jaguar independent rear suspension in the back, and I'm also gonna replace this 16 inch rim with a 17 inch rim to match the rims that are in the back. Both of those things are gonna have an impact on how the car sits. And that just goes to show again, how nice this coilover setup is, because as I make each one of those changes, I can adjust this up or down to have the stance that I want and the handling that I want. And then when I make another change, I can adjust it again. If you like what you've seen, please click like. If you'd like to see more, please subscribe. Thanks for watching.